So we had a very nice uh, scientific working group session uh, during the EHA where we could discuss about molecular testing of patients with MPNs. Uh, indeed, in the past years, there was a tremendous progress in technical progress for finding new mutations using especially next generation sequencing or NGS. And it has been shown that many additional non-driver mutations could be uh, present in patients with either JAK2, MPL, or CALA mutation. And some of these mutations induce uh, change in the prognosis of patients. Some of them are bad uh, mutations. Uh, uh, so-called high-risk mutations such as A6L1, IDH1 and 2, TP53 mutations, etc. So we had a very nice presentation by Professor Cross from uh, England and also Professor Guglielmieri from uh, Florence in Italy, who uh, discussed who should benefit from more intensive uh, mutational screening by NGS, for example. The first indication that clearly came out from this discussion are patients who may benefit from allogeneic stem cell transplantation because finding additional mutations has clear prognostic significance for these patients. A second point, very interesting, raised by uh, Dr. Gugliel-Meli was the patients with very low JAK2 mutation that is very slightly positive at diagnosis. And she showed that in these patients, you may find other mutations by NGS. So it's interesting also to propose that for these patients. Another possible subset of patients are those who are so-called triple negative. Those who don't have one of the three driver mutation, neither JAK2 V617F, nor CALA, nor MPL mutation. So in these patients, you may find additional myeloid mutations that may help you to confirm the diagnosis of a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Then we had a debate with uh, Professor McMullin from uh, Belfast and myself uh, whether to know whether it was important to quantify the JAK2 mutation or not. Indeed, I think that quantifying JAK2 mutation at diagnosis may help sometimes to uh, question the phenotype of the patients. For example, if you suspect a phenotype of essential thrombocytemia and you find a very high JAK2 allelic burden, this is quite unusual and makes suspicious this diagnosis and may prompt to screen for masked polycythemia vera, for example, that can be found in these patients. Another point is during follow-up, because we have several drugs or strategies that now may show a change in the JAK2 mutation. For example, we showed that for a long time already with interferon alpha in the proud and continuation PVs, showing that you can reduce very importantly the amount of JAK2 mutation in these patients. And this is now also found in uh, patients treated with ruxolitinib, for example, as like in the MAGIC PV study presented by Professor Harrison, showing that reducing the JAK2 allelic burden with ruxolitinib in patients with PV was associated with a better outcome, and in particular, a, a better event-free survival in patients who achieved some molecular response compared to those who did not. Professor Gugliel Melo also showed a study where reducing the JAK2 allelic burden in PV and ET patients was associated with less risk of transforming to myelofibrosis. So, in all, I think testing for JAK2 mutation and quantifying JAK2 mutation at baseline and during follow up of the patients may now, in 2023, provide important uh, information that may in the future also help to design a better strategy, maybe switch drugs in patients in which we don't see a clear decrease of the allelic burden or an increase during follow-up, and maybe also stopping therapy because we showed, for example, that in patients who were treated with interferon, it was possible sometimes to discontinue therapy and patients remain in complete remission without treatment. And this was particularly true for patients who achieve a deep molecular response with JAK2 mutation that was reduced below 10%, for example. 